podcast day. It's podcast day. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Hey Brownberry Knitting Podcast. Pardon me while I adjust your view slightly. I'm Mars. Thank you for coming to my space on YouTube to join me. It's podcast day. Let me just do the obligatory fussing with my hair because you think you look fine and then you turn the camera on and things go wonky. A big, big welcome to any new subscribers who've just found me recently and a hearty warm welcome back to those of you who visit with me here often. I have been wanting to podcast for a while, but as my friends know, I won't get in front of the camera if I don't feel I have something to say because then I'm uncomfortable and awkward. And who needs that? So today I thought I do have a few things to share and I do have a few things to say. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. I had to put on the rest of my wardrobe for podcast day. I wish you guys could feel the softness of this beautiful silk scarf. See if I can give you a view of some of the printing. This is an eco-printed silk scarf made by Maria, who is ninja.chickens on Instagram, and you can find her at ninjachickens.org. Oh, it's just such a comfort to wear beautifully crafted handmade items. And there's something a little extra special when you know the maker. Check this out. Maria sells these silk scarves in her Etsy shop. Um, some large, like this one and some smaller ones. And they are botanically printed with different plants, most of which she gathers from right in her own garden. She came to visit me last week, and I hope that some of you will go and check out the Ninja Chickens podcast here on YouTube, because we had some fun adventures. We embraced our inner middle schoolers and went to Disney, Disney World, right here in Florida where I live and uh, spent the day there riding roller coasters. As I said to Maria, it had to be a birthday celebration for someone I love for me to get on a roller coaster. All of you amusement park enthusiasts out there, hats off to you. <laughs> it took uh, a lot of gumption and some encouragement for me to get on some of those rides. I'm just gonna be honest. I have a hard time with things that move that quickly and catch you off guard. But at the same time, when it was all done, I could really appreciate the thrill aspect of it. Um, I, I like quiet and stillness like the next maker, but it's nice to be shaken up a little bit sometimes. It was a lot of fun. And Disney is called the happiest place on earth for a reason. It's just, we had a, a beautiful day, cool weather. She was great company, Maria, no surprise there. So we had some fun. So it's nice to be sporting some of her handiwork while I sit and chat with you. I was actually sitting here knitting when I thought about recording this short episode. I'm working on a test knit project, and because it's a test knit, I can't tell you too much about it, except that it is a large project that I'm loving so far and tucking into, and you can see the yarn color here. It's coming up a bit brighter on the screen than it is in real life. It's actually a very deep blue. I would call this a royal blue, if that helps put it in context. Um, not quite navy but a rich color with lots of dimension. And I'm working on my Chowgu spins, which are bamboo wooden needles. They're actually called spins because the join where the needle meets 
the cable. It rotates and swivels. It's hard for me to show it to you properly, but just trust me. They spin for a large project, something with a big circumference like this. It is so convenient to have just the right needle to join. These are very smooth and I've had good experience with my Chowgu needles. The fact that they swivel means the cable doesn't get twisted up when you're making your way around a larger circumference. This is going to be a garment type item. It's a, it's a cloak actually. And there are a good number of stitches on the needles. I need room to put everything under it. So it helps that these needles work with me and work with my hands. What are you knitting on or sewing or crocheting? You know I love interacting with you through this channel. So if you're like me and you comment during podcast viewing sometimes, pause right now and tell me what you're working on this week. I'd love to hear about it. I'll be working on this project for a little while, but it's one of those that I can really settle into because a good portion of the pattern doesn't require too much concentration, just enough to be interesting. It's my favorite combination of working the design and then rest rows in between. Of course, I'll share more with you about that when it's the appropriate time. I always feel really honored to test a pattern and even more so after having released my own design. Some of you lovely, lovely people out there have purchased and have even started knitting my Pebbles and Pathways sock pattern. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I finished a second pair very recently. And you can see them here. If this is new to you, the Pebbles and Pathways socks are a toe-up construction and I've included some cable detail on both sides of the patterning of the foot and leg, as well as a garter stitch detail in the center, and a little bit of twisted stitches in order to frame that patterning. So this is a pair that I knit for myself recently, primarily because I wanted to try out this yarn. I think I've talked about it before, but just in case, this is an abundant earth fiber yarn, which was introduced to me by my friend Jessica. Hi, Jessica. See you soon. <laughs> um, this is cinnamon. It's a natural American targy blend. Um, and I believe it's out of Washington State. And I loved it. I changed my own pattern up a little bit. So if I can do it, so can you. I modified it to be a shorty sock. So you can see the cuff is not very long. I believe it was about... 18 to 20 rows of twisted one by one rib. And that was to make the most of the single skein. This is actually a heavier weight yarn. It's a little heavier than fingering weight. I believe it's a DK. And so I used a slightly larger needle and knit shorty socks to pretty much use up almost all of the skein. Other than that, I followed the Pebbles and Pathways pattern. Guys, I'm not even going to be coy about it. It is a real joy to see all of the socks that are coming out using this pattern. I didn't, I don't think I fully understood before what it's like to birth this kind of baby. <laughs> um, there, there is a joy in translating your own thoughts to paper. There's joy in making something and seeing it come out the way you intended but none of that matches the joy of seeing another person take that idea, spend their time, and celebrate that concept by knitting it themselves. So that's been an amazing thing to allow me to connect to others in the community. And while we're on the topic of socks, it does happen to be one of the things that I knit quite often. Where are my sock knitters? I also finished this pair of socks I've got both of them knit and 
I thought I'd share them specifically with you because the thing that really thrills me about fiber crafts is that there is always something to learn. So I've knit a lot of socks. I've made them for multiple members of our family. I've made pairs for myself. I've tried different designs and I'm constantly working on how to get a really good fit. But still there are things to learn. <laughs> I have never used this particular wool before. It's a Lang wool uh, self-striping sock yarn and it comes with a spool of reinforcement thread which I take to be um, a really cool extra and I'm sure you could use it anywhere in the sock including the toes but I chose to use it in this pair only in the heels. And just to up the learning quotient a little more, I also tried two different types of heels, one on each sock. Because when I do have trouble with sock fit, it tends to be right across here, the top of my instep or that area where your ankle diagonal begins. And when socks have fit poorly in the past, it's because I've used a short row heel or another type of heel that doesn't allow enough depth. I was going to say width, but it's really about the depth of that heel cup. And so the tightness really shows up across the top of my foot. So the two heel types that I tried in these socks um, were things that I've wanted to try for quite a while. The first one was the mini gusset adjustment by Mina of The Knitting Expat, who is one of my favorite podcasters. You may know her. She is the, knitted, the Knitting Expat on Instagram, and she has The Knitting Expat podcast here on YouTube. She's a prolific designer and just really good at putting out useful content and inspiring projects. So she has a mini heel flap adjustment. I hope I'm saying that right. I'll link it down below so that you know what I'm talking about. She's got sock patterns available on Ravelry and one of her basic sock patterns includes that adjustment piece, which is an excellent resource because really you can, you can use it with just about any sock and she gives you instructions for toe up and top down. So one of the socks included that adjustment, which was a really cool thing to learn. Uh, that was this one. And when you're just looking at the sock, you can't really tell that anything special is happening. But that adjustment happens right in this area. Sorry, <laughs> looks like I'm being rude in the way that I'm pointing. Let's use the index finger. It happens right in this area and it doesn't really mess with the rest of the shape of the sock. Um, and it was very easy for me to do, even though within the heel, I was carrying both the yarn and the reinforcement thread. So you can see there's still that short row heel shape, a very nice fit, but it allows for a bit more depth. And then this diagonal measurement gives me more room. In the second sock, I used a suggestion from Maria, who had tried this short row heel cup adjustment. Uh, essentially what you do is you knit a few extra short rows uh, within this portion of the sock where that ankle bone join uh, sits on your foot. And as you're knitting the heel around, um, if you think about a standard wedge heel, if you've knit socks before, as you're knitting the heel around in order to give yourself that extra room, you put some short row shaping on either side. And on this, you can see a bit of the puckering that happens because of those short rows, but you cannot see that once it's on your foot and stretched out over that section. Now, the funny thing is I use the reinforcement thread on both of these socks. But look at the difference in the heels. On this one, it's not only that the reinforcement thread striping was happening at a different place in the spool. 
I think it's also just the format of knitting. So I, there's a lot more marling and splashes of color in this version where I was working back and forth in short rows at a specific point and then continued on the heel versus this sock where the adjustment was happening in a much different place. I don't want to give away paid pattern information, but the adjustment was happening in a different place. And then I continued on with the reinforcement thread. So it's just a cool thing to see the difference that happens when you're using um, one or the other types of techniques. If you knit socks and you um, use different methods like the afterthought heel or a short row heel or heel flap and gusset, you know that each one of those has its own effect on the way your heel looks in the end and the way your yarn striping, if your yarn has specific color rays flowing through it, you know that it has an effect on how that looks. So like I said, you're always learning something when you're making and there's that's great, there's nothing wrong with that. So many of you have participated in really important conversations that have been happening. Uh, primarily, I've been following these conversations on Instagram because that tends to be where I spend most of my social media time. These are conversations about inclusion, diversity, representation, racism, uh, white supremacy, the place of, of black, indigenous, and people of color in the making community as one one ecosystem, but really in community as a whole, because honestly, don't we all come to this making community from a huge variety of other communities? So those conversations, and I am calling them conversations because I choose to approach it as a dialogue, one in which I am listening sometimes, and one in which I am speaking sometimes, um, and then I go right back to listening. Um, the conversations are critical ones that are happening, and I think by now all of us are in some state of finding our place. I think there are several people who've put out great information. There are books that have been recommended to the um, white members of our community or people who don't identify as a person of color. There are people who are being discovered, uncovered, rediscovered because of these conversations who do fall into marginalized groups and for one reason or another are, are using their platform or being asked to say their piece. So um, I don't have a whole lot more to say to others about that. I am a person who is learning at 43 years old how to process and deal with my own thoughts and how to move through the world in a way that feels honest. And so much of my contemplation around this has to do with what is my lived experience? What have I learned from those experiences? How do I feel in my day-to-day -day world? And then how can I ripple out good things from that experience to others? It's certainly not a naive perspective for me because um, that lived experience is not always shiny. It's not only about knitting. That was dramatic pause because some days I wish it was all about knitting and only about knitting. <laughs> but hello day job and real life adult responsibilities. Um, yeah, so it's not a rose-colored view. It's just one that has so much variety and gives me a perspective that I know not everybody will or should share. So my focus around all of these topics is where do I sit and where am I? Because if there's one person I really need to sit with and check in with, it's me. Um, you guys know when I ramble on about these things, I do them in a stream of conscience, a stream of conscience kind of way that couldn't be scripted if I tried. So I'm giving you unfiltered some of how I feel. And the thing I can grasp to most clearly is how do I feel about myself, my platform on social media, what I have to offer, what I've gained, which is a lot. And when I see and read and hear and learn things, what I can do with it. One of the things that's been great has been the opportunity I've had to 
find more people who are making and creating and inspiring. Um, it started very simply with a list of Black, Indigenous, and people of color who are dyeing yarn. Yarn is a common medium for a lot of us, and selfishly, I, you know, I'm still thrilled at the possibilities of color and yarn bases and what can be created from the mind of someone who starts with a blank canvas. So I started with yarn dyers who fall into those groups and collected them into um, an Instagram story highlight. And I didn't find them all myself. In fact, most of them came from other people recommending these yarn producers. Some are shepherds, some are indie dyers, um, some dye fiber, and they were sent to me, suggested to me when I asked for people from these groups who have these things to provide. And that hits home for me on several levels because I have dyed yarn, I have been a business owner in that particular arena. I am a black person. I, I do identify with, with more than one marginalized community. But it also hits home for me because it is about the economics of our craft and our passion and our hobby, if you will. And where we spend our time is, is so important, but where we spend our money is such a tipping point. And where we invest, especially financially, I mean, it, it tends to make a huge difference, not only in an individual person's business, but in the community as a whole. So when I reflect on where I sit in this topic, that's the space I come back to. Who am I supporting? What am I buying? What's the story behind that material? And that's not to say that I will only buy from one specific group or type of person or type of producer, but it is to say that I gained a lot from asking the question, do you know people in marginalized communities providing this one piece of our craft? And I was thrilled to see how many answers I got back. Selfishly, it gave me an excuse for a little retail therapy to go support those people. <laughs> and it also helped me make some really critical connections for future designs and to put together people within my network. So for that, I am very grateful for the new blogs and articles and Instagram accounts that I found, I'm very grateful. I am not an expert on any piece of this topic except my own experience and my own intention. So that's that, that's where I am. I have probably only a couple more things to show you, so let's get to it. You guys, I sewed a thing. This is, I think it's commonly called a mug rug. So you put your mug on it. I don't have a mug near me, which is really weird because I'm almost always drinking coffee or tea. I do have a sparkling water can, just to <laughs> demonstrate the use of this handmade item. It is roomy enough for a mug and a snack, and I made it from a kit that was provided by my friend Natalie, hi Natalie, who is Remembrances Pottery on Instagram. First of all, red is my power color, so she knows me a little bit. Secondly, I've never done a quilted kind of patchwork project like this before. And Natalie sent all of the pieces that I needed in order to make this, including the thread and some great instructions. As part of the Pins and Needles UK um, new fangled make along, Zoe, who's an amazing podcaster, she encouraged us to try something new and with very broad parameters, you could decide on something that was new to you and use the group encouragement to give it a try. And that was sewing slash quilting for me. This is also part of my plan to sew a project each month this year. 
I'm going to be honest with you guys. I said to Natalie after making this, I think I'm going to give up on the idea of being a person who sews. I felt like she did such a great job of providing the instruction, giving me all the materials, and all I had to bring to it was a little patience and time and skill. <laughs> I have to resist the urge, even in this moment, to be self-deprecating and to critique this mug rug. And so instead I'm going to do my go-to, which is to express gratitude. I'm so grateful for the time that I had to sit with this, stew on it, mentally connect to my friend and finish something useful. Guys, look, it is wonky as all get out. I mean, finding a straight line is kind of like a Where's Waldo game. The back, wonky-er. <laughs> the binding, I mean, if you sew and this is hard for you to look at, avert your eyes. It's okay. There is nothing here that says, um, even, even semi-professional <laughs> or advanced amateur, this is just a jolly good try. <laughs> I'm glad I can laugh about it now because on the day of, I was so frustrated. There's nothing like being challenged by something that you're not immediately good at. Um, and I know as a grown up, I should adjust to that, uh, but I refuse to be comfortable with it. It was very uncomfortable to be in that space of just not matching up my corners and not feeling like I was getting any of the binding right. But you know what? I put it down for a day and I did talk to a couple friends about it. <laughs> Um, and then the next day I started using it, which was the whole point, was to make something very pretty to look at that I could use. And this is that. Um, if I was striving for perfection, I wouldn't have started. So I encourage you to go and check out the newfangled make along in the Pins and Needles UK Ravelry group. Um, it's a great group, very encouraging. Zoe is very uh, active and interactive in there. And my February sewing project is done. I'm pretty, pretty proud of that. What new things have you been trying? Do tell. I have to tell you all, this scarf makes me feel very fancy. Okay, moving on. I will spend a little time telling you about a few new to me things in uh, continuing that theme. One is a farmer by the name of Cheris. I will put all information about Tar Heel Billy Farm down below and stop potentially butchering her name. <laughs> this shepherdess was new to me and I found her through my request for BIPOC yarn producers. And she has Tunis sheep. This is Tunis fiber. I have never used this fiber before. I'm going to show it to you in each of the forms I have it in right now. I'm a spindle spinner, so I'm taking my time making my way through the four ounces that I purchased from Tar Heel Billy Farm. This fiber, still some veg matter in there, it's pretty dreamy to spin, guys. I have really been enjoying this. I'm just trying to give you a sense of what it's like. Um, it's a longish staple. I need to do a bit more reading on it because a lot of times I'm not the best judge of how a fiber is typically described because my measures are easy to spin or hard to spin. Those are not technical metrics. <laughs> but this one has been, has been pretty easy to spin. It's very grabby. Um, it has been fairly easy to go from one piece to another and, and rejoin them in. And the spun fiber, here are some singles. Let me see over here. The spun fiber is so springy and elastic. It's, I, I have not spun anything before that was this bouncy. Can you see that? 
Um, I love it. It's so easy through the hand and it has a natural thick and thinness that's happening probably because of my spinning style, but also I think it's, it's just part of the way this spins up. It, the way it was prepped um, was in a, a bat. It wasn't um, sort of an organized roving. And then I've two plied it here. This is a washed skein and you still get some unspun bits. It just naturally kind of unspins and you know, you can see where it's coming apart a bit in some areas. But I love it. I actually am very anxious to knit with this. And I've committed to spinning the whole four ounces and then doing a project with it. And I'm very excited to see the kind of texture it creates. Have you spun with Tunis? If you have, um, set me straight in the comments as to the characteristics of this fiber. I think it may be different if I were spinning it on a wheel, but I'm enjoying it, so that's what matters. I'm gonna keep going on that until I've finished the bat and plied it all up, and then I'll decide on a nice, smaller project that will showcase its texture. I was just listening to Louise Scully on the Knit British podcast the other day. And I really enjoy that audio podcast. It's such an easy one to listen to. I have to say hello to Louise if you're watching. Some of you have commented that you enjoy watching my podcast or really listening to it. Um, and so thank you for the compliments about my calm voice and so on. I, I will tell you that it's getting in front of the camera and knowing I'm going to connect with you that brings me down to a more zen level. I'm not necessarily the calmest person in real life. <laughs> My friends can tell you that. Um, but I do feel calm when I sit here, and Louise does that for me in her audio podcast. I love listening to uh, the breed study reports that she reads out from those who have tried out the specific breed uh, fiber for that episode, and I could listen to that all day. I find it fascinating. While listening to that podcast, I heard about the the make-along that she's running, which is called Fieldwork. And the Fieldwork make-along, at its essence, is a make-along for using yarns that are produced by the Edinburgh Yarn Festival uh, vendors that will be at the festival in Edinburgh this year. And there are several of them. I think she said there's over 60 of them, and she's listed some on her website. I am going to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival again this year. Oh, I can't wait. It is really a highlight of my spring. So when I heard about this make-along and that it was for using yarns from the exhibitors, all wool yarns, I went back to my stash from Edinburgh Yarn Festival last year and came up with these. So these three yarns were purchased at the festival last year. Some Irodale Shetland, this blacker mohair blend, which I've already knit with and love. Actually, I've knit with all of these already. And this Jameson and Smith Shetland. So of the three of them, only the blacker is a blend um, of wool and mohair. It's a 50-50 pure new wool and mohair, and I used it in a pair of socks, and I love it. The color is very rich. It's very easy to knit with. Uh, I love the grab in all of these. When I say grab, I mean that that wooly feeling, the um, just the textural feeling of a yarn that isn't highly processed, maybe a bit more guard hairs. Than usual. I love that. And all three of these have that characteristic. So the make along encourages you to use those yarns and I'm going to do that. Now I am not entering for prizes so I want to state very clearly that I realize that the blend from Blacker Yarns does not actually qualify for the requirements in the make along. But I'm giving myself a pass since I, I, <laughs> I am making myself ineligible for prizes. I just want to be part of what's happening and use up these yarns from EYF 2018 
hopefully before I head to EYF 2019. So I'm going to make the Lineate hat pattern by Elizabeth Doherty, and I'll link that below. I'm not doing a lot of editing this time around, so normally I'd show you a picture. Actually, hang on, I can show you a picture. All, pat all podcasters think it's funny when we tell you to hang on as though you're really here, but hopefully that makes you feel connected. Hang on, I'll be right back. <laughs> so uh, I ran to get some pictures of this pattern. It's called Lineate by Elizabeth Doherty. There we go. And it's a simple colorwork hat that has been in my queue for a while, and I'm very excited to make it. Here's a front view. So as you can see in the example, the brim of the hat is done in a contrast color, obviously your choice to do that or not, and I do choose to put that bit of detail in there. And then you use two other main colors. Well, wouldn't you know that these yarns that I have that are left over from other projects, the Jameson and Smith and the Uradale have almost exactly the amount of yardage I need for a medium size for that hat. Now that might mean I'm cutting it close and a bit of yarn chicken may be in order, but I think I'm going to go for it. And then my small contrast at the brim will be this blacker. I'm excited to cast that on. I only haven't done it yet because there's some other projects I want to make progress on. So that's the fieldwork make along. Check it out in the Ravelry group um, or Knit British or on Instagram if you use the fieldwork M-A-L hashtag, you'll see some great projects already finished and some underway. And the last thing I want to share is a new to me dyer who very, very kindly sent me some sample skeins. Oh my goodness. Okay. Be right back. You guys, I am not too old to play dress up. And seriously, this scarf begs, it just begs to be used in a hundred different ways. Complete tangent, but I was going to put this around my neck and it ended up over my hair and now I love it. <laughs> Back to the topic at hand. <laughs> I was very kindly gifted these skeins of marionated yarns. And I'm going to make sure that I don't mispronounce um, yes, it's marionated, which is really a play on the dyer's uh, name. <laughs> so she sent me these beautiful yarns after asking if I would like to sample some of her hand dyed yarn. And I said, yes, I'll take a skein. And we talked about the colors that I like. And she sent all three because she said she couldn't choose. So this beautiful, colorful, just piece of eye candy is Quintessa, which is the fingering weight. It's 100% superwash merino. Isn't that gorgeous? I'm going to turn it over just so you can appreciate all the color that's happening there. The blue stands out and purple and some of the greens, but really it's like your eye can't land on any one color. It's all beautiful. The colorway is marsh lights. Beautiful, beautiful. There's some, there some marshy areas here in Florida, and um, they're pretty, but I don't know if they're this pretty. <laughs> and then this deep, deep purple. I'm holding it back a bit in the hopes that you're getting the same color I am. Yep, that's about, that's about right. Maybe slightly lighter. This is her Playtime DK base. So this is a DK weight yarn, and the colorway is called Amethyst. I'm in love with DKs. I have a pattern design coming up for a shawl that's done in DK weight yarn. It's that perfect in-between. Isn't that beautiful? Amethyst. And then this last one is her Playtime Worsted Base. And that is 100% Superwash Merino as well. And the colorway is Cassiopeia. I want to use these all together. Now, the dyer behind Marionated Yarns has offered to send me more for giveaway. And because so many of you have been so supportive 
to the tune of many, 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 many of you being here to join me. Um, I think I'm going to take her up on that. I was instructed to keep these for myself. Otherwise, I'd happily share. But I also will happily knit with them. Um, thinking if I do something like a crochet shawl, I can use all three of these, regardless of the fact that they're different weights. The, their colors just scream to be used together. So thank you so, so much. Check out Marionated Yarns. You can find, uh, you can find her on Instagram. I want to wrap up with a quick plug for the folks who've already come on over to my Ravelry group, the Hey Brownberry Knitting podcast group on Ravelry, and I'd like to invite you to come and join us there too. We have a couple very active threads. One is for a Pebbles and Pathways soft knit along, and the other is for a make along, all crafts included, called Finally Fix It. It's the Finally Fix It make along, and just as the name suggests, I'm encouraging you, I had some kind of technology blip there. Um, the finally fix it make along is to encourage you to pull out that project that has been hibernating, hiding, marinating, and waiting for you to finally fix it. My family has returned home, so there's going to be some more background noise now. Hubby apologizes. I asked him if he wanted to join me, but he doesn't want to, so I'm going to wrap it up. The finally fix it make along is to encourage you to pull those projects out from the shadows and finally fix it. It doesn't matter what it is, darning some socks, fixing a quilt, um, readjusting a sweater, whips welcome obviously, and straight through the next four or five months, you can, Drew is over there doing weird dances trying to distract me. It's terrible. <laughs> We have several months, I believe the end date is in July, to fix it, and I'm holding up, for accountability purposes, the next thing I intend to fix, which is my Georgetown cardigan. I love this cardigan so much, so much that I'm going to finally fix it. The seams on the sleeves were done in mattress stitch, and one of them is perfect and the other one was not placed in the armhole properly. Even though it looks, you know, the stitching I like, so it looks fine, but when I wear it, the seam tends to roll over on my arm. That's not what was intended. The sleeves are also a bit tighter. I don't know if that has anything to do with my penchant for donuts. Either way, I want to be able to wear this cardigan, and the fix is fairly simple, I think. It's going to involve unpicking this sleeve seam which I intentionally left open at the end just for a little design detail and once I take out the mattress stitching I will either add in a panel of additional fabric um, or just see if I can block it out a little larger and then reseam it and for the one that has a seam that's rolling around, I'm actually going to have to take it all the way out of the armhole of the sweater and fix it, uh, reposition it. So I would love your company to take this on. Come join us in the Ravelry group. You can use the hashtag finally fix it, K-A-L on Instagram. And uh, as always, reach out to me if you have questions. I will link information below for the things I've talked about today, and until then, I will see you next time. Thanks for being here. Bye!